What's up to all my Google Ads developers out there and welcome back to Performance Max for Developers. I'm Devin and this is episode seven, Asset Group Assets. Just a quick reminder, hit that thumbs up button if you're enjoying the video and don't forget to subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with all of the latest content. Now, we've been receiving a lot of great comments from you all in the last few weeks. We really appreciate that. That helps us know what types of content we should make and also it can even influence the API itself. So to that end, we've been using a tool called the Interactive Guide. I use it mostly as a visual aid in the second half of most of the videos. I'd love to get your thoughts down in the comments as to whether or not you think this is useful. Has it been you know, a useful visual aid for you in going through these videos? Have you been using it yourself? Well, whatever your thoughts, we'd love to hear them, so please drop a comment down below. So with that, let's dive into Asset Group Assets. So you may recall this diagram from episode five when we discussed asset groups. Asset group assets are effectively the mechanism we use to attach assets to asset groups. They're a link between the two entities. Now, if we zoom out a little bit further so we can get the whole PMAX picture, you can see where asset group assets fit into the entirety of the process. So as you can see here, asset group assets are part of that bulk mutate request that we issue in order to create a valid serving PMAX campaign. And throughout this series, I've been using arrows to denote the relationship between entities. And as you can see here, there are arrows pointing from both assets and asset groups to asset group assets. And what that means is that we have a reference in the asset group assets to both our assets and our asset groups. In episode two, we created the assets in a prior set, a completely separate independent request. So we can use the asset resource name of that existing asset. However, in the case of asset groups, those are part of the same bulk mutate request, so the resources don't yet exist. So what we'll do is we'll create a temporary ID, use that to create a temporary resource name, and that's the resource name we'll use in our asset group assets. Now it's really important to note that you should always include the asset group operations prior to the asset group asset operations that reference those asset groups in your list of mutate operations in your bulk mutate request. Basically, you need to make sure you don't reference something before it's actually created. Up to this point, we've been assuming that you create the assets ahead of time in a separate request. However, it is possible to include the asset creation operations in that bulk mutate request. When you take this approach, the assets will be given a temporary resource name containing a temporary ID, and as with asset groups, make sure that the operations that create the assets come before the operations that create the asset group assets that reference those assets in your list of mutate operations in your bulk mutate request. And then finally, you can use a combination of two. You can create some assets in a separate independent request prior, and you can create some at the time of the asset group creation. It's really up to you. There's no right or wrong approach here. It really depends on what you're trying to accomplish and what your infrastructure looks like. So we know that asset group assets contain references to both assets and asset groups in the form of resource names. But asset group assets also contain another important piece of information. This field, which is called field type, lets Google know how that asset should be used in an ad. For example, a text asset could be a field type of, say, headline, long headline, description, or business name. And when you start filling in those field types, this diagram starts to look more like this. And you can see with that field type populated, Google can understand your intention with those different assets to effectively create ads for you. Field type isn't a new and any given asset can be one or more different field types. For example, a text asset could be a headline, 
a long headline, a description, or a business name, whereas a YouTube video asset always has a field type of YouTube video. This page, which is from our documentation and linked in the description below, shows the different field type options for each asset type. It also includes some specifications and requirements for each one. For example, each asset group has to have exactly one business name that's 25 characters or less. Keep in mind those minimum requirements don't apply in PMAX retail campaigns. As I pointed out in episode four, Google can actually pull the information required from your Merchant Center account. However, if you do have those assets available, we encourage you to use them because it helps Google's machine learning algorithms to more effectively create ads and better target consumers. When it comes to creating assets and attaching them to your asset groups, you have two different options. The first one is the one that we've been going through throughout this series, where you create the assets ahead of time in a separate request. This is that Google Ads library concept. When you take this approach, you have to issue a search request of some sort in order to get the resource names of the assets that you want to include in a given asset group. The other option is to include the asset creation in the bulk mutate request itself. The first approach has some advantages, uh, particularly as it relates to code maintainability and scalability. I like the idea of handling asset management separately, perhaps in a separate microservice. It really just helps to keep things manageable. If you start to bring all of those asset details into the overall method that creates the bulk mutate request, things can get messy pretty quickly. In addition, this can help reduce redundancy. For example, let's say that you're using the same brand logo across multiple asset groups or even multiple campaigns. Well, it wouldn't really make sense to issue a separate new request to create that logo every single time you want to use it. Instead, you could just grab the resource name and reference it. The downside of this approach, I guess if there is one, is that you do have to issue another search request. So I guess this could be viewed as a more complex flow. Let's illustrate these concepts by revisiting my fictitious business, Devin's Music Mania, that I introduced in episode five. If you recall, we're having a holiday campaign and I have an asset group called Drums. Let's further assume that I have a web app that's built on top of the Google Ads API. And in that web app, I step people through the process of creating a PMAX campaign. So they'll fill in a lot of fields, including some of the asset group information, and then we'll go through some steps to add assets to that asset group. I'm going to choose to do this one asset field type at a time. For example, let's add marketing images to my drums asset group. So what you might do is present the user who's going through this flow with a list of all of the images they have access to. Then they could select the appropriate ones to add to the asset group. Now, if you recall from episode two, we conveniently named our assets to begin with the asset field type. You might not want to do this in practice. This is really for convenience and illustrative purposes. And you can see how it's useful for this example here because a user can go in and easily select the two marketing images related to drums. In order to present a list like this to the user, you do have to issue some sort of search request. So here on the page, you can see an example of a very simple search request. Select asset name from the assets resource where the asset type is an image. So we're selecting all of the image assets and their names. Now we include the name in the select clause so we can present it to the user. We'll also need the resource name because we're going to pass that to the asset group asset. However, that's included by default in our search results so I don't have to explicitly include it in the select clause if I don't want to. Now this is a nice flow, but what if a user wants to include an image that they haven't already added to their asset library? Well, we wouldn't want to disrupt this flow by taking them out of it, so maybe we can just include a button like this. When the user clicks it, they can upload their image, and you can either do this in a separate request or include it in the bulk mutate request, like I've said multiple times, 
and that's really up to you. And with that, you can see how these different approaches kind of work together to create a dynamic user flow. So now let's flip to the interactive guide to see how we might implement this code in practice. And before I jump in, I just want to preface this by saying we've used an approach here that's kind of generalized, somewhat contrived. There's so many different implementation options that I really just wanted to make sure that the concept of retrieving assets and then attaching them to your asset group was demonstrated here. I'm going to start in the overview section of the guide just so you have a better idea of where the asset group asset creation fits into the broader picture. So at the top of this method, you can see we create assets in a separate request, adding them to our asset library. And then below, we issue a bulk mutate request that's composed of several mutate operations. And in this line, you can see we create and add asset group operations. But keep in mind, that's not just asset group operations. It's asset group operations and some related operations, such as our asset group asset operations. So let's head over to the asset group section of the guide. And here you can see that we simply create asset groups. And the important thing I want to point out is as we iterate through the asset group objects, first we create the asset group operation, then we include the asset group asset operation. Very important. Now, I've chosen to nest the creation of the asset group assets within asset group because we need a reference to the asset group resource name with the temporary ID for each one. And by doing it this way, we can ensure that this flow still works if we have one or many asset groups. Now, flipping to the asset group asset section of the guide, we can see some code that demonstrates how to actually create these asset group asset operations. At the top here, I just have a hard-coded list of asset field types. This isn't an exhaustive list. I've only included the field types that have a, a minimum requirement to create a non-retail PMAX campaign. So what I'll do is I'll iterate through each of these, and for each one, I'll find the assets that I want to link to my asset group, and of course I'll want to get their resource names, and then I'll create asset group asset operations for each. So let's jump into the get asset resource names section here. This step is akin to the diagram I showed earlier where a user selects assets from a list, but in the interactive guide, we assume there's no UI and that you do this all programmatically server-side. So at the top of my method, I have three hard-coded hash maps indicating the asset type, minimum required, and maximum allowed assets for each asset field type. I'll then get those values for the provided asset field type parameter. And with that, I'll construct a search query. And that search query will get all of the assets of the asset type with a name that begins with the asset field type. And as you remember, we conveniently named the assets to begin with that field type, and then we'll limit our results to the maximum number allowed. So for example, if our asset field type was headline, here's what our search query might look like. Next, we issue the search request, get our results. We have a check just to make sure we have at least the minimum number required of the asset field type. And then we return all of the resource names. Back in the parent method, I just want to point something out. I have some code commented out here, but this is an alternative to the step we just took. So instead of performing a search request, you could just create those assets on the fly. And the way the interactive guide works and the way these methods are written, these will create new assets in a completely independent request. But as I've mentioned several times, you can also include them in the bulk mutate request itself. And then finally, we create the asset group asset operations for each individual asset, attaching it to the asset group, and add those operations to a list that will return to our parent method in the asset group method, uh, which will create our bulk mutate request. So let's hop into that section. And here you can see this is pretty straightforward. We create an asset group asset with the asset resource name, the asset group resource name, which will contain a temporary ID, 
as well as the asset field type. We wrap that in a mutate operation and return it to the parent method. So that about wraps it up for this episode. Asset group assets aren't that complicated in their own right. I think the complication really lies in the different implementation options, which are going to be dictated by your design choices, your campaign goals, as well as your infrastructure. In the next episode, which is the last episode of this series, we'll be covering an important topic, campaign conversion goals. I'll see you next time.